Um, the subject that I would like to talk about today is um, I found a parallel between this week's Parsha and Maimed Har Sinai. And I would like to discuss that parallel. And um, I believe that the concept is a very fundamental Jewish concept, which is a little bit overlooked. Um, the idea of counting in general, we know that there's an issue of counting. If I'm not mistaken, they're making a census soon. And every time that there's a census made in Israel, there's a whole discussion. Well, if a lot of it take, take part of the census, not a lot of take part of the census, because there's an issue to count Jews. And I guess, um, I don't know when it's happening. Lev, you probably know when that's happening. When's the census happening? I, didn't know. I haven't heard anything about a census recently. It's, com it's, co it's coming soon. I don't know. 25 years ago. Okay. Well, it's, it's, happen it's supposed to be happening. It's supposed to be happening. It's supposed to be happening. Um, we don't like counting. And here we find the Kodesh Baruch Hu, who is uh, counting us again and again. And one of the problems of counting is that people, so to speak, lose their identity. And there is a, a, uh, a way to overcome that difficulty, which seems to be the Degolim. The Degolim are the flags that each tribe or each group of tribes had that I guess that we would call it that gave them their um, character, right? In the army, the different platoons, each one has their own symbol and they have their own flag. And that's what helps make Seder for the people. So when you make unity, so then you lose to a certain extent um, the, the uniqueness of each individual thing. And the flag somehow, we're going to try to discuss that a little bit, somehow gives us back that unity which we are looking for. I've spoken in the past about this idea in Western culture that everybody has a right to vote. Do you think that that's fair, that everybody has a right to vote? Alan, what do you think? You have to turn on your thing. Mel. Press, you press the space bar to turn on the... Just if, 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 if everybody, it's, it's a leading question. Should everybody have a right to vote? Uh, and, uh, democratically, yes. Uh, from a certain age. Every country has a different age when they have to vote. So... Uh, I didn't ask what the law is. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, that wasn't my question. I asked a different question. I asked, do you think that it's fair that everybody has a right to vote? I'm going to share with you the following story. Um, there was a Moetzis meeting just about 45 years ago. And um, one of the esteemed Rosh Hashivas at that meeting was voted down. Okay? And um, it was voted down by one vote. And he said, I don't consider myself being voted down by one vote. Why? Because some of the Hasidic Rebbe's that are here, the reason why they have a place is because they were a rob of a certain community. I was a rob of three communities. So I should have three votes. If just being a rob of a community gets you a vote, so I should be three to one over, over these guys. Now, what is wrong with that line of thinking. The assumption that they got the vote because they're out of a community. Well that well that was his assumption, but that we're not gonna argue with that. We're saying even if we go with his with his uh, hypothesis. Well he's the representative of all of those communities, but he's only one representative. It's not asking the right. That's not asking the right. Okay, okay, I accept. I accept that as a 
you have made the matters foggier. No, no, it's, I, I accept that that as some kind of a, there's a baseline. There's a baseline. In order to have a vote, you have to be of a certain stature. Once you have that vote, we're not discussing who's greater than the, than the others. So therefore, you only get one slot. Okay? But now, I would ask you a question. A person has a medical question. And he asks 10 doctors. Nine doctors says he should do one thing. And then he asks a world-class doctor and he says to do something else. So do we go after the majority? It's, 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 it's all, it depends who you feel comfortable with because the same scenario is if you, uh, somebody asks a rabbi uh, 10 questions and he goes with whatever's comfortable for him. If, if you offer 10, 10 different rabbonim, uh, a shaila, he will go with whatever he thinks, whatever suits him, he will go with. You know what that fellow is? Suicidal. Sorry? I'll tell you why. That fellow is suicidal. And I'll explain to you why he's suicidal. I assume that the person who we're talking about is not a medical professional. So on what basis is he going to go after the guy who he likes? That's pretty ridiculous. He's not, he's not, he's not qualified to make a decision. So he's suicidal if he makes that decision himself. You don't, you don't agree with me? Well, I, I like this Derek Harris, but what about the truth? <laughs> you disagree or don't disagree? You have to put your mic on. All right. Anyways, this is so the answer to the question is if somebody would ask me this question, and I'm going to say this, I said this over more than once. A lot of times I'm asked halachic medical questions. And sometimes I have the liberty that I know world class professionals in America in that specific field. And I'll ask them their opinion. Sometimes, usually I listen to them over the local doctor. However, sometimes I will listen to the local doctor over them for one reason. The local doctor saw the patient. And as good as you are, but there's a difference when you're hands-on. You know, that's, you know, the, the diagnose over the phone is just only so good. So sometimes my feeling says that you have to go for the man who's on the seat. But generally speaking, uh, and you know, I'll just use this as, 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 as in the numbers, the best professional doctor in certain fields over here do in five years what the world-class professional in America does in a week. There's just no, there's no comparison. So if I had to listen, all things created equal, if I had to choose who to listen to, the nine doctors here in Israel don't hold a candle. It's not nine against one. It's like that Gunnel said, said, in, said in that meeting, I'm worth three times as much as him. Okay? So I, when I say that I will ask, I will trust the doctor who is the world class over the nine others, even though we go Bosero, because his expertise puts him in a different class. It's not a row and a miot in the same class. It's a miot in a higher class, and that definitely beats out the, the numbers of the lower class people. That's a... a a rule of thumb, you know, that's what I call it a, an intellectual rule of thumb is how to approach an issue and you have to make a decision. That's why you listen to the professional over five other people. And actually, Eliashev has a true about this philosophy and whether speaking about it in halacha, as you made that comparison, or speaking about doctors. Why is it that you listen to the professional over the novice in the field? When we're speaking about counting people, and this is the question, do you think that we count them, we're saying that they're all equal or not? So 
Silent Plies Ascent. Okay, I, I gave two choices. I'm not sure what this consent is to. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, share with you a um, question. I said this once in Shul, but I'm saying it again in this venue. I believe that it has a different uh, appeal. When my Shiva was a little boy, he met a man, and it was right before Shavuos, and that man asked him the following question. It says in the Medrash that when Klal Yisrael stood at Har Sinai, so it wasn't a mob, there was an order. There were the elders first, and then the lessers and the lessers, and each person stood, I will quote the words from this week's parsha: Ishal Machaneo Ishal Digloi. Each person stood according to his diligence, understanding, and capacity of Torah. And he asked the question, what did the last guy in Kalal Yisrael think? He looks in front of him, he sees 600,000 people, and he looks behind him, there's just an Anani Akovit, you know, just like pushing him back, you know what I mean? Like, how did he feel exactly, that fellow, Mr. 600,000? How did he feel? Sheffer, how do you feel? Privileged to be there, not on the outside of the anonym, like the Arab Rob. That's, that's, uh, that's a beautiful answer. I really, I, I really do like the answer, but you didn't address the question that I asked. I'd rather be here than on the other side, but I am the lowest of this group. How does he feel about that? If he's not a fool and he understands who he is, he's grateful. I, I like that. I like that answer. I like that answer very much. I believe that that answer is true. I'm going to offer two other answers, and they're they're congruent with what you're saying. There is Zan of La Arroyos and Rosh Lashualim, and he's willing to be Zan of La Arroyos. So I understand. But, but that, that doesn't address the question. Yes, you know, what you're saying is, is very much related to what Sheffer said before. But Lamaisa, how does he feel in relation with the others? So Sheffer says, I said, well, I'd rather, rather be a, a, a major league player than a double A player. That's the bottom line. But how does he feel when he looks at his, at his comrades? Does he feel lesser or not? So Sheffer says, Sheffer says, I look at where I have come to, and I'm thankful for that, and I'm Someach Bechalki. And you, Yehuda, are saying a very similar idea. You're saying, the bottom line, I can get way more than I can over here than if I be anywhere else, so stop wallowing in stupidity. Right? Is that basically what you're saying? Okay, see, I, I, I hear pretty well. In different words. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just making it clear that everybody should understand, understand what's going on. But this man, he offered to Shiva a different answer. And he said, what do you mean? All of Klal Yisrael is one body. Your feet don't complain that they're on the bottom and your head's on the top. This question of where do I fit in? Where's my piece of the pie? that's based on a lack of unity. If Chal Yisrael stands at Har Sinai, Ki'ish Echod Belev Echod, so the question doesn't arise because you don't see the person as a competition, you rather see him as a part of you. So it's a really a, a beautiful answer. A really a beautiful answer. And uh, I'm not argue with the two answers that we give before because those are also beautiful answers, but this is a little bit more sublime. Emma Rashi said, that's a very nice answer. However, I want to answer something else. And his answer is even a more amazing answer, but it's not so useful for us, but I'm going to share it with you what he said. The person is enthralled. He's speaking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Peh El Peh. Do you think 
that he notices what's going on around him? The question is preposterous. If you would understand the concentration, the involvement that he has when he's watching this Maimon Harsinai and learning directly from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he didn't notice that there was anybody in front of him at all. He was totally absorbed. That's how we're supposed to learn Torah. We're not going to be looking around to see who has a better seat. The question is, anybody who asks this question, says Mashira, didn't understand what Maimon Harsinai was. It may be a good question, but it'll only be a question if the question popped into somebody's head. It's not going to come to your head if you're thoroughly absorbed. That's just like a person who's reading a novel. He doesn't say, well, what time is it? Why does he say, what time is it? Because he's not distracted. Looking around to see who's around you, that's an aspect of distraction. That means that you are not totally absorbed. Which is, I think it's a beautiful answer. And... Um, it's not so useful for the point that I would like to discuss today, but it's a beautiful answer. It's a good way to walk into Shavuos and we think about this idea of being Ishach or Belei Vachon. Yisrael stood in formation. And I'm going to use this muscle because I, I think it's really great. A person has a 50,000 piece puzzle. A 600,000 piece puzzle. Now, in that 600,000 piece puzzle, there are bigger pieces and there are little pieces. Are all pieces the same? Is not, there no, a difference? They're not uh, the same, but they, they're necessary to complete the puzzle, each one of them. That's, that's right. That's right. Now, that's, that's, that's the Nakuda, which is really, really so important. There, of course, is a difference between the top man in Klal Yisrael and the bottom man in Klal Yisrael. But there's no Klal Yisrael without the bottom man. There's a common denominator. And just think about it. There is a piece of Torah that every single individual has that's unique, and without it, the Torah will not be complete. Yes, there's a Eber Shanashama Tluyabo, and there's a Eber Shanashama Tluyabo. There's a person who is more center stage than others, but it's not going to be complete, even if you're missing a small piece. And my muscle for that is, what I call the Big Bang Theory. You could have a very nice big balloon. All you have to make is a very small hole and it's all over, right? Why is it so mockery? Why do you have to have everywhere is closed off? If it's not closed off everywhere, you have nothing. So the 600,000 people that there are in Kal so there is an aspect of them that they're equal. Because without it, it's incomplete. This is a very fascinating idea. Not only is it not complete, there's something which he has to offer that is unique, and there's nobody else that can replace. That's Ish al Machanehu, the Ish al Digon. What's so important in life is to understand that you can't be in two places at once. You know, there's a famous, a famous Jewish joke. I said this over in Shul recently. I'm just repeating it again, because here it has a different uh, connotation, that there was a Jew that said to Rockefeller, if I'd be you, I'd be, have all your money, I'd be richer than you, because I'm a shoemaker too. Okay? Now, if you be Rockefeller, you probably wouldn't have the time to be the shoemaker too, right? It's really, it's a ridiculous thing. But, you understand this is a Jewish, a Jewish mind at work. That's, that's basically what's going on over here. A person who understands his place is not jealous of somebody else's place because my place is unique and nobody can do what I can do. And I, you know, 
I sometimes am, I'll give you this example. Uh, I consider myself more handy than my 12 year old son. It's not such a big chachma because I have much more years of experience of being handy. But sometimes there's a very small screw that has to be put somewhere and I just can't do it because my fingers are big. So what do I do? I call my little kid who doesn't really know what's going on, but he could do the piece of work that I can't do. Why? Because he's equipped for it and I'm not equipped for it. I'm just not, I'm not equipped for it. I can't do it. Not because I don't want to do it. Not because I don't have to know how to do it. I'm not built to do it. I am not jealous of my son that he is 12 and I am not. I would say that I'd like to have the mental understanding that I have today and be 12 years old. That would be a wonderful thing to have. But I'm not looking to trade places with him. I'm not jealous of him. I'm just not jealous of him. I'm happy to be where I am. I'm happy he is where he is. And there's no competition. This can only happen in the world of Ruchnius. Because only in the world of Ruchnius can we really be one. There is nothing that unites us in the world of Gashmius. The only thing that there is in the world of Gashmius is what I call a marriage of convenience. What does that mean, a marriage of convenience? I need this. You have that. So it's worthwhile for me to make room on my bench for you because this way I will have what I need, okay? But it's all about me. It starts with me, it ends with me, and you are just a tool for me to get what I want because there's nothing about my Gashmias that relates to your Gashmias. In Ruchlis, it's not like that. In Ruchlis, there's such a thing that we actually are one thing and each person actually helps the other person out. And I'm going to use this as a, as, as a muscle. And I think that it's, it's very, um, uh, you know, we can argue about it. I can't prove it to you, but I think I could show it to you. And if you're not in an arguable mood, you'll accept what I'm saying. The G'dayli Yisrael feel for the small man. That's because they have Avasiso. Why do they have Avasiso? Because they're big people. Yeah. And they, but, 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 but that's not that you have to explain that. Yes, that, I, that is the answer. But what does that mean because they're big people? What does that mean? That means they understand the value of every eat. I'm going to share this with you, this story. Um, I must have been about um, 18 or 19 years old. And the Rove in Detroit at that time was in his 90s. He was a, a, a wonderful person, a sweet yid that the Chavetz Chaim sent to America in 1930. And he had shingles. And he was suffering. And one of the Rabbanim came with his small son. And this Yid who lived in America was a successful rabbi in America for like 60 years, still didn't speak English. And um, this rabbi came with his son who didn't speak Yiddish. And the rabbi tells the father, your son is here. He's Tinoikus Shel Beis Rabbim. I want your son to give me a bracha. So you just imagine this, you have this 90 year old man that's asking this eight-year-old boy to give him a bracha. And there's a very big language barrier. And the eight-year-old boy is frightened. And the, this Rav is begging this eight-year-old boy to give him a bracha. It's just a beautiful, a beautiful scene to watch. And he said, look at that Abbas Yisrael. Look how much he cares. Look how much he appreciates an eight-year-old boy. I challenge myself included, I don't think that any of us would have that much value for an eight-year-old boy. We don't have that Abbas Yisrael.
do you think that that rabbi would feel bad if that eight-year-old boy was in front of him at Har Sinai? I don't think so. I don't think so. So we have we have in this week's parsha. We have we have the this week's parsha. Just one second. We have in this week's parsha um, this kind of an idea. We we sit on Shua's night and we learn. Wonderful mimic, a nice thing. When we sit, is our is our mode with the earnestness, with the desire to not be lost this moment which we're having. What's going on on Shavuos night? Shavuos night, we are supposed to be gearing up to Kabbalah Zatayr. We're supposed to be gearing up to this idea that when we're going to be here in Kriya Zatayr in another three hours, we're not going to notice anything because we're going to be totally absorbed in being Makabal Zatayr. That's how the learning on Shavuos night is supposed to be. Now, this is a, a fascinating thing. Uh, I would like to share this with you. I don't really know. What is one supposed to be learning on Shavuos night? My wife had a grandfather who was a Pasha to eat. He was far from a Pasha to eat, but he was, he go, we could call him a Pasha to eat. And he would say, Tikkun Lel Shavuos. And that sufficed for him. There are other people who they do their daf yomi. The other people go to shiurim. If everybody's doing what everybody else is doing, that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because you are unique. Your shvuas has to be unique. Your ish al machaneu ish al digloi. You're going to have to, on shvuas night, get a special piece that belongs to you. And there's nobody else that can take it away. And we are all there to help you get your special piece. That's what's going on on Shavuos night. Now, this is a, a, I didn't say we shouldn't go to Shurim. We shouldn't do, we should learn whatever we can. But a person has to find his unique spot. And I believe, and I'm saying this right now because Kasher Yachanu Ken so is the words in this week's Parsha. The story goes that the Rebbe of Shmelka, he would never really sleep. And one time his brother came and he told him you should go to sleep in a bed. He said, I have to learn. He said, no, you're tired. The kids are so finally talked him into going to sleep. He lay down in bed. His brother put a blanket on him and he fell asleep, he slept the whole night, and he woke up in the morning, and he was clear-headed. And he said, wow, this is an unbelievable thing. I'm able to learn now so much better. And there's a lot of Hasidic stories around this story of how that's called that you slept L'shem Shemayim, but that's not the point. The Hasidim say uh, at the end of the story, um, Kasher Yachanu, can you so? As he rested with the proper intention, can you so? That's what gave him the, the locomotive to go weiter and to serve Hashem the next day. This is an important, we have to prepare ourselves for Shavuos. We have to prepare ourselves to go forward. We're going to have to prepare ourselves for ourselves, our Torah. We have to prepare our own personal Torah. I just, this message tonight that I want to share with you is that the counting of each individual is so important. The menucha of each individual is so important. I'm thinking right now, and I'm sharing this with you. There are tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people that are not sleeping in their beds tonight. From the Tanya, 
to Shderot. What kind of kasha yachanu can you sow can these people have? We, Baruch Hashem, Shashem Yishmoratonu, Shaloneda, Shum Tzorah, we can go to sleep, we can prepare. There are others who can't. Manoim Chalkenu. I just like, I just, I feel it's a chiv to say that when we go to sleep in our beds, just think for a minute about others in Klai so that are less fortunate. They don't know if they will wake up tomorrow and find their home standing. What kind of preparation Menuchas HaNefesh can they have when they don't have a home, they don't know where they're going to be tomorrow. As we prepare ourselves for Shavuos, and Baruch Hashem, where I can't say the words, relatively secure. People tell me, yeah, they were up last night taking pictures of the rockets being shot. We're not so far away, but Hashem Yishmarenu. We have to take the opportunities, at least when we sit in the base Madrash. It should be kasher yachanu ken yiso. We should be totally absorbed and not be wondering about what's going on outside. Outside, I don't mean outside the shul. I don't mean outside Beit Shemesh. Right now, we're supposed to be totally absorbed like Klal Yisrael and Har Sinai. And if we're there, Ish Echod Bolev Echod Vada Echodesh Baruch Hu will respond in the same fashion and he'll give us a large piece of Torah, the Torah for Toshin Pei Aleph. And we should be Zoycha Mirz Hashem to be Korob HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This Yom Tif, be Zoycha maybe possibly that it should be Yushalayim Abnuya. All right, have a have a good Shabbos, a good young